Have you ever wondered why food is essential for humans? And how this food, made of complex particles, breaks down into tiny particles? This all happens through a proper system in our body, called the digestive system. The food we eat contains complex particles like carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, etc. The organs present in the digestive system break these complex particles into simple particles, so our body can derive energy from the food. This energy is vital for all body systems to function properly. The digestive system also plays a role in excreting waste food from the body. The digestive system is a muscular tract or passage with a mouth at one end and an anus at the other. This tract is also known as the gastrointestinal tract, digestive tract, or alimentary canal. Inside the gastrointestinal tract are many hollow organs connected in a long series. These organs help break down food, transport essential nutrients like sugars and proteins into the blood, and excrete waste food from the body. These organs include the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and anus. Additionally, the liver, pancreas, gallbladder, and some glands contribute to food digestion. An adult human's alimentary canal can be up to 30 feet or 9 meters long. Now, let's study these organs one by one in detail. Number 1. Mouth The mouth is the first organ of the digestive tract. As soon as you take the first bite of food, digestion starts right away. The mouth is also referred to as the oral or buccal cavity, and it consists of three essential parts. Teeth, tongue, and salivary glands. These parts physically digest the food. The tongue, a muscular organ, helps taste the food and aids in rolling and swallowing it. The teeth grind and crush the food into tiny pieces so that it can be easily digested. This process is called mastication. The third essential part of the mouth is the salivary glands, found in pairs near our ears, beneath the tongue, and close to the lower jaw. They produce saliva, which lubricates food, making chewing and swallowing easier. Saliva, a transparent liquid, contains special enzymes like amylase and lysozyme. Amylase, also known as pyelin, helps in digesting carbohydrates, while lysozyme kills bacteria and fungi, preventing them from growing in our mouth and protecting us from diseases. Thus, it wouldn't be wrong to say that saliva is extremely important for oral hygiene. A healthy person produces approximately 1 to 1.5 liters of saliva in 24 hours. Partial digestion occurs in the mouth, and this partially digested food is known as bolus. Number 2. Pharynx The bolus passes from our mouth to the second organ of our digestive system, called the pharynx or throat. This is a passage that connects the mouth and esophagus and serves as a path for both food and air. Number 3. Esophagus The partially digested food, or bolus, enters the esophagus from the pharynx. Also known as the food pipe, the esophagus is a 25 cm long. 1.5 to 2 centimeters wide muscular passage connecting the pharynx at one end and the stomach at the other. Alongside the food pipe, there is a windpipe present in the human body. When we breathe, air passes through the windpipe to the lungs. Conversely, to prevent food from entering the windpipe, a cover called the epiglottis is present over its opening. During swallowing, this epiglottis covers the windpipe, and the tongue pushes the bolus into the food pipe. The food reaches the stomach through muscular contractions called peristalsis. At the end of the esophagus, there's a muscular valve called the sphincter. Once the partially digested food completely enters the stomach, this valve closes, preventing liquids or solid food from moving back into the mouth. If these muscular contractions reverse, it's called antiperistalsis, and it can cause vomiting. Number 4. Stomach the stomach is a sac-like, J-shaped muscular organ located below the diaphragm and on the upper left side of the abdomen. Beneath the stomach, there is a leaf-shaped gland called the pancreas. In front of the stomach is the liver, and below that, on the right side of the abdomen, is a pear-shaped organ known as the gallbladder. The stomach temporarily holds partially digested food, also known as bolus, and breaks it down completely so that it can be easily transported in the blood and energy can be generated. The inner walls of the esophagus and stomach are covered with a thin membrane called the mucous membrane. In the stomach, this membrane is known as the gastric mucosa, 
and the epithelial cells present in it secrete gastric mucus. This mucus is not only helpful in the lubrication and breakdown of food, but also protects the inner linings of the stomach from acids. The epithelial cells of the gastric mucosa also release various gastric juices. These juices play a vital role in digesting carbohydrates and proteins present in the food. Approximately 1.2 to 1.5 liters of gastric juices are released daily. The gastric juice includes various components such as hydrochloric acid HDL, electrolytes, and a specific protein-digesting enzyme called pepsin. Due to the hydrochloric acid, the pH of the gastric juice is highly acidic. With the help of these gastric juices and the stomach's churning action, the bolus is converted into a yellow, thick, creamy liquid called chyme. The stomach absorbs many substances like glucose, simple sugars, and amino acids. Similar to the end of the esophagus, there is also a muscular valve at the end of the stomach called the pylorus. When this valve opens, chyme enters the small intestine. As soon as the stomach empties, the pylorus valve closes to prevent food reflux, meaning the return of food to the stomach. Number 5. Small Intestine The next destination for chyme is the small intestine, which we also refer to as the small bowel. It's a loosely coiled muscular tube, 22 to 25 feet long, with a diameter of approximately 2 inches, located in our abdomen. The small intestine is divided into three parts the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. With the help of pancreatic juice and bile, the small intestine assists in further digesting chyme. Pancreatic juice is released from the pancreas and contains enzymes that break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates present in chyme. Bile is produced in our liver and stored in the gallbladder. During digestion, bile is released into the small intestine through the bile duct. Bile plays a significant role in the digestion of fats in the chyme. In the duodenum portion of the small intestine, the chyme is mixed and digested, while in the jejunum and eye limb parts, the digested food is absorbed into the blood. The internal lining of the small intestine has special structures called villi, singular, villus. If you look at the internal structure of villi, you will find a network of blood vessels. These villi increase the surface area of the small intestine so that food can be completely absorbed into the blood. In this way, after complete digestion in the small intestine, the maximum portion of food is absorbed into the blood, while the waste produced from food digestion moves into the large intestine. The large intestine, also known as the big bowl in our vernacular, is a muscular tube 5 to 6 feet long. It's called the large intestine not because of its length, which is actually shorter than the small intestine, but because of its wider diameter, nearly 3 inches. Like the small intestine, the large intestine also has three parts, the cecum, colon, and rectum. The cecum is the first part of the large intestine, while the colon connects the cecum to the rectum. Food waste travels from the small intestine to the cecum and then moves into the colon. In the colon, excessive salts and water in the waste are absorbed and enter the bloodstream, solidifying the food waste. Furthermore, bacteria present in the colon further break down food waste, completely degrading it. At this stage, the food waste is referred to as stool or feces. Beyond the colon, the third part of the large intestine begins, called the rectum. The colon delivers stool to the rectum one to two times a day. The rectum is an 8-inch chamber that connects the colon to the anus. The main functions of the rectum include receiving stool from the colon, temporarily storing it, and excreting it from the body. Number 7. Anus The last part of the digestive tract is the anus. It consists of two anal sphincter muscles, including the internal and external sphincter muscles. The upper lining of the anus has specialized sensors that detect the content of the stool and send signals to the brain, indicating whether the stool is solid, liquid, or gas. The anal sphincter muscles control the evacuation or excretion of stool from the body because the rectum contracts and the sphincter muscles relax when signals to release stool are received from the brain allowing waste to be easily excreted. Conversely, if no signals to release stool are received from the brain, the rectum remains relaxed while the sphincter muscles stay contracted, so the stool remains stored in the rectum. 
This is why our internal sphincter muscles remain in a contracted form while we sleep, so we don't need to go to the bathroom, whereas relaxation of the internal sphincter muscles triggers the need to use the bathroom. During this time, our external sphincter muscles play an important role in temporarily holding the stool. Thanks for watching.